Hi everyone, um, I'm Abby, and this is my session based on my MA research, and it's just talking about um, Anne Lister and LGBT heritage and how we can teach LGBT history in heritage spaces. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So a little introduction about me, um, Shamai, I'm Abby. Um, so like I said, um, it's just based on my MA research that I've completed last September. Um, and there's a little picture of me on the side there graduating this summer because 2020 and 2021, not the best time to be a uni student. So graduated finally this summer. So a bit about me, I'm a, I'm a museum assistant um, in, a local, in a local Cardiff museum and um, I have a bachelor's in history and international politics. My master's is in history and heritage and they're both from um, Aberystwyth University with my main research um, field of interest being um, queer and sex history with a little bit of Welsh history thrown in there. So before I carry on, I just wanted to give you a little background on my research. So I decided to look a bit more into Anne after my BA dissertation focused on um, female sexuality between 1830 and 1914. So I only focused, I only had one chapter on lesbianism um, and with only a brief little paragraph on Anne and, and Walker um, due to word, word limits and things like that. So for my MA being on heritage studies and me wanting to dedicate a huge research chunk of time to Anne, I decided to see how she'd affected how people see LGBT heritage and history within heritage spaces. So that there was my study born. So I created a survey that asked people, fans of Anne Lister in particular, how they felt um, she had affected um, had the way they view their heritage and their history, um, if they can, what they consider, if they consider Shibden Hall to be a, a purely LGBT heritage space and um, just things like that, just seeing how they felt about Anne and her life really and how her life has affected her and how Gentleman Jack in particular has affected their lives. Um, so it was 15 questions. I had 15, 57 responses with age ranging between 18 and up to 70 years old. Um, and it was just to see how, they, how Gentleman Jack has pushed Anne into a whole new level of popularity and a um, whole new band of fans everywhere around the world. And with that, I think it's time for my research to do the talking. So next slide, please. So um, Gentleman Jack proved very successful around the world with it averaging, with series one in particular, averaging about 6.8 million viewers in the UK alone. Um, Gentleman Jack proved to be way more popular than the 2010 drama, The Secret Diaries of Anne Lister. I don't know if any of you watched it, or anything like that but if you haven't it focused on um sort of Anne and her relationship with just Anne and Mariana and it didn't really have didn't really focus on historical fact it diverged somewhat from fact and such like that so um Gentleman Jack should be in particular praised for its accuracy not only with Anne's life but also down to museum um, down to um, costume down to set design and things like that so if we look at my survey and the little, little pie chart that's on your screen at the moment, we can see that a majority of people that took my survey found Anne through Gentleman Jack, with only 11% of them finding Anne through The Secret Diaries of Anne Lister. But in particular, what was interesting to me was the 19% that found her via their own research. And I found with some of these answers, some of the, a lot of them went to Shibton Hall found Anne via just visiting on holiday, things like that, and then going home and researching her after, finding the secret diaries, finding Gentleman Jack and finding her diaries and finding the whole team of transcribers that we have transcribing Anne's diaries. And it's quite interesting. And due to the massive shift in popularity due to Gentleman Jack being shown around the world, a little town called Halifax and a little hall called Shipton Hall became a huge meeting space for fans. And so a huge influx of visitors are now visiting Shipton Hall and Halifax yearly, daily, monthly, anything. So between in the summer seasons, 
between 2019 and 2020, some of the most important times for a heritage site. There was a boost in visitors to Halifax and also a boost in the local economy. The new influx of visitors contributed to 3.14 million pound to the local Halifax economy just between 2019 and 2020. And due to the high level of fans coming to Shibden and coming to Halifax, with this new money, they can put towards keeping upkeeping Shibden, upkeeping the research time, upkeeping everything that goes into running a, a heritage space as old as Shibden Hall. And as I work in an open air museum where we deal with buildings that are from the 12th century, 13th century, I really understand how these how this money, especially from visitors, we are a charity, the museum I work in. So museum visitors really do give us a lot of money and gives us a lot of, it's a lifeline. All this money that go, comes from the summer seasons, it really is a lifeline to how we as museums and how heritage sites can upkeep and can keep going in a way and carry on their research into Anne, into Anne Walker, and even into the other figures in Anne's life, her father, her aunt, her grandparents and such. So it really is important. And with 100% of my survey responses saying that they believe Shibden Hall is a queer heritage site, the hall has embraced their newfound popularity within the queer community. They see themselves as a safe space for queer people to come and explore their history. And during my dissertation, I decided to take a risk. I emailed Shibden Hall to see if they'd get back to me. And in an email from Richard McFarlane, the museum's manager, at Calladale. he I asked him about Gentleman Jack's effect on Shibden Hall and Anne's effect on the local economy and such. And he wrote back to me, Gentleman Jack has increased the publicity and visitors to the hall. It's apparent visitors are coming solely because of the association. But while they do recognise that Anne is such a major part of LGBT, LGBT community and history and community, McFarlane also wrote back to me saying it's important to portray Anne as a complete person, not simply defined by her sexuality. And it's important to recognise that while Anne was, you know, a good sort of leader and businesswoman, she wasn't a perfect person. Her main intentions with her girlfriends and Anne Walker was to gain money for her businesses and such, but Anne, but Shibden Hall has never tried to hide and um, sexuality and treated it like an embarrassment as I found with one of my survey participants when she went to Newston Abbey, the home of Lord Byron, famously supposedly bisexual. When she asked one of the guides if they had anything sort of to do with his bisexuality, the, often the guides treated it with embarrassment and tried to sweep it under the carpet and tried to tell her that no, but Lord Byron wasn't bisexual. I don't know where you're getting your facts from. So you can see this a lot Within heritage sites, they often try and hide their queerness. And Shibden has always tried to embrace Anne's identity and strives to educate visitors on Anne's life, even into the 80s. McFarlane told me since the 80s, Anne Lister's story at Shibden has been presented very openly and they make no attempt to hide any part of this, even as sort of sexuality and lesbianism and queerness has become less of a taboo subject. They have never tried to hide it but they have so much history to teach. Shibden is 600 years old, and with such a rich history of the other listers that lived at the hall, like Anne's father, her aunt, to so many more of her ancestors, it's very hard to pinpoint what parts of history you teach. And they've never, but they've never tried to hide Anne. They've always put her front and center. They've never tried to hide her behind some lister that lived 300 years before her. They've always put her at the front. And that is proof that heritage sites can learn from Shibden. You don't have to sweep them under the carpet. You're embracing a site's queerness will bring in more visitors. Embracing a site's queerness will help you develop and change and grow as a site. And more people want to learn about their ancestors in within the queer community. We want to learn about our ancestors that lived 300 years ago and had to deal with such homophobia and be hidden from society and a problem that I found not only working in a museum but while I was researching 
is how you how do you teach such a life as Anne Lister's? She lived such a short time, but lit, did so much, and let, and that is all down to labels. Labels are such an important part of heritage spaces. They're a museum's best friend, and they help us as museum assistants when it comes to teaching people history. We in my in my workplace we have countless open um, buildings that we've moved from across Wales. And we also have three traditional museum exhibits that display everything from skeletons, clothes, farming equipment, and other really important parts of Welsh history. But how do we teach people all about this stuff in a label? Um, that's only supposed to be around, be around 100 to 150 words. People will only read a label for about 30 seconds and move on. And that is something not only have I learned during my master's, but during um, practice with talking to the curators in my workplace, people will only focus for a short amount of time. So the problem is to try and catch their attention on a label. So it needs to be concise, it needs to be to the point, and it needs to just teach people about the basics. If people have the basics, they're open then to move on and learn more. But often you can get people ignoring the labels or just forgetting what they've read after 30 seconds and moving on to the next label. And that's why sort of the media is so important when dealing with these things, because people can go to Shibden, read a label, forget about it, but remember a name like Anne Walker or Anne Lister or uh, Mariana or um, Tib or something like that. They can research that and find Gentleman Jack. They can find the secret diaries of Anne Lister and they can learn more by watching a TV that's very engaging, very, very accurate in some cases with Gentleman Jack about what is actually going on at Shibden. And Gentleman Jack has introduced so many people to her extraordinary life. And it's giving a positive representation to many in the queer community who see themselves in Anne. And one of my survey responses um, wrote back to my survey, quote, I think Gentleman Jack has given lesbians a focal point to have the courage to stop hiding from society. My partner and I have been together for 35 years and yet no one knew until Gentleman Jack gave us the courage to live out in the open. And this quote has stuck with me since I started writing it, it still stuck statistics with me a year later. The fact that I often think about it and think about how hard it must have been for these women to hide the most basic thing about them, who they loved for 35 years even in the last 20 odd years with the mass acceptance of LGBT people in this wider society, this woman still hid, this couple still hid. And it might just be down because the fact she didn't, hasn't seen herself in a museum or on a film or in TV. So once you see yourself represented on your screen, you feel seen. And, you know, even just going to the simple thing of going to a cinema, to a museum and seeing your history, shown to you can give you the courage to do so much like this woman did like you know we've not just been around since the 60s we've been around since the days of Sappho we're not just a modern phenomena lesbians have been here for decades and Gentleman Jack and you know Anne and Anne Walker's story has inspired so many queer women both young and old to express their identity and has given people a, a figure to point to and to use as an example of queer women in history is often not only young people, young women like me, that need a figure to look at when expressing our identity. It's often our elders in our community that need that figure to see what we need, see us and rep our representation of people in history. You know, often people who, you know, have, see have lived through a time where People, the queer people were persecuted for being themselves and having a queer person in history years before that can really change your outlook and it's not being hidden or ignored if you have that focal point in history it can really change how you see yourself and how you see the community the the show is also a huge help to queer women as gentleman jack is such a positive representation of lesbian relationships which is not widely shown in the media. In 2016, for example, an American TV show called The Hundred killed off one of its two queer um, characters just after starting a relationship, just after she'd got her happy ending. 
And, you know, it's part of a long line of lesbian characters, queer women characters who have been killed, have been given an unhappy ending just after they've gotten happy, just after they've got the girl of their dreams, they've been killed or they've been sent to prison or something ridiculous like that. And 2016, it saw a lot. Media in 2016 really became a focal point of ill treatment of queer women. And it could be argued that this, that year, 2016, was a boiling point for the ill treatment of queer women, for the unnecessary character deaths and the unha unnecessarily unhappy endings. And it's quite rare for gentlemen, for a show like Gentleman Jack, to show a happy ending, to show a, um, a couple, a queer couple with such a happy, healthy relationship at times and ending the series with them getting married, a happy ending. Season two, maybe we would have seen a maybe another happy ending. You never know. But the type, this type of treatment towards queer people have dated back since the 1950s with the American um, media portraying a trope called bury your gays to kill or give your gay characters, both male and female, um, an unhappy ending. It was how you had to treat queer characters. You had to send them to prison. You had to kill them. You had to make one of them straight and marry a, marry the marry the person, marry a guy or marry a girl, make them and break them up. And then this slowly passed into British media, and we've seen this trope continuing over the last sixty years to give people an unhappy ending, even though we've had mass acceptance of LGBT people for the last 20 years, it's still happening over and over again. But this has been well thought for, having LGBT history and LGBT issues in mainstream media, in school and in other heritage spaces, especially in the UK, due to a little law called Section 28. So while Section, Section 28 stopped or prohibited um, talking about gay people, you know, it created a lot of anti-gay propaganda. And while Section 28 was repealed only in 2003, it still has a major knock-on effect for young queer people like myself who've grown up, you know, in, a, in the early noughties, in the 2010s, with still the mass in, in, misinformation on queer people in our community's history. You know, we were born in the late 90s and early 2000s, but we still grew up with such a negative light shown on the LGBT community that we have anti-gay slang in schools, we had anti-gay sentiment in schools, you know, things like that. Therefore, with many queer adults looking for a place to explore their identity and their history after not being taught it in schools or seeing it on the media growing up like I didn't, Heritage sites are so important and media like Gentleman Jack is so important. How a play, having a place to explore LGBT history is so important as many of my responses were from young people. Um, you know, it's, in, it's embedded in our culture sometimes not to have a positive light shown on queer people. So, from two of my survey responses from two young people, young women aged between 22 and 25, one of them said, more needs to be done to promote LGBT historical figures and LGBT heritage sites in the UK. A lot of heritage sites probably have LGBT history, but don't promote it. And the other said, I would say that there are not enough sites that portray and integrate queer lives as a piece of history. So I think there needs to be a lot more visible queer history ideally sensibly curated by queer people. And while these two women don't remember Section 28, they still grew up, like I said, in the after effects of it, where people, we didn't talk about it. And we didn't, and we often used the word gay as an anti, it's a negative slang word for something. And that can be very damaging for queer young, for young people like me, you know, who thought being gay was such a negative thing because of the negative slang terms that we had for it. People who view their ident themselves and when coming to terms with their identity, many people go through a lot of negative thoughts because of the way the media 
interrogated spaces and treated us. But having a show like Gentleman Jack, a space like Shibden, that actively encourages and supports their queer their queerness within history, it's so important. And having people like being taught about people like Anne and Anne Walker, and even down to Tib and Mariana, having sort of pinpointed historical figures that are positive representations of lesbians and lesbian history is important to how many young adults can connect to their heritage and can accept their identity as gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, etc. So moving on from Anne and Shibson Hall, if I could have the next slide, please, thank you. Um, I'm going to discuss heritage sites and other queer media, because while Gentleman Jack is quite a rare thing, it's an it's in a TV show that gives lesbians a happy ending and shows them in a positive light. And heritage sites have changed people's outlook in the last 20 years. And 10 years in particular, this section, in this section, I'll talk about Vita Saxville West and Virginia Woolf, the ladies of Kangochen, their homes, and how other heritage sites can display queer heritage. So many people in the community believe that LGBT history only tends to be taught within two months of the year. LGBT History Month here in the UK, which is held in February, and um, Pride Month in June, and in often in the case with some heritage sites. However, places with a strong connection to LGBT history, such as Shipton Hall, become to, have begun to teach their heritage all year round. It can also be seen in Sissinghurst Castle in Kent, which was the home of bisexual author and playwright and poet Vita Saxwell West and her husband, Harold. Both of them had several affairs in their life, in their marriage, especially Vita, who had affairs with both men and women, most famously with Virginia Woolf. Um, uh, Vita is famously the um, model for the novel Orlando in 1928, which was published at the end of their relationship. It's basically a love letter to, to Vita from Virginia as they romantic relationship was slowly deteriorating and now Sissinghurst Castle is owned by the National Trust um, and so and it shows it had displays many of Vita's love letters not only from Virginia but also from her other female lovers Violet Treface and Edith Lamont as well as it has e Vita's untouched writing desk um, which only has two pictures it only ever had two pictures on it and it was one of her husband and one of Virginia. She only kept those two pictures on her desk. And we can see the growth in um, visitors to Sissinghurst after 2018, after a film called Vita and Virginia was published on um, talking about their love affair and ending with the publication of Orlando. So um, you had Gemma Arterton, quite a famous actress playing Vita. So you, you not only you've got her fans drawing, your, drawing them to the movie, you've got queer people wanting to learn about their history being drawn to the movie. And then also Sissinghurst does so much, not only, and National Trust does so much to promote their queerness. And you even had the book, The Love Letters, written, edited by Alison Bechdel. Um, and we can see, like with Gentleman Jack, the film led to more people like me discovering that Virginia Woolf was even queer and another queer figure like Vita and more queer people to trace their history back to. It wasn't just Anne Lister and Anne Walker and Sappho. There's more people out there that you can trace your history to. Sissinghurst, like I said, is a National Trust property. And in recent years, the National Trust has become more aware of their queer history in their sites. In March, 2021, the National Trust received a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And in a statement on their website, they revealed that the grant would be used for a new project called the Queer Heritage Collections Network. The network involved, it, involved four other queer heritage organizations and is a database for heritage spaces and how they can teach and access LGBT history and how they can display them and how they can teach it effectively. The Queer Heritage Collections Network is basically a teaching tool for other heritage spaces within the UK to teach their queer history. Um, the next space I'm going to talk about is if, um, Plas Newydd, um, here in Wales, my home country, and it's um, the home of the Ladies of Llangollen. Um, Lady, uh, Lady, Lady Eleanor Butler and Miss Sarah Bonsonby, two Irish women who ran away from their families to be together and settled in a small Welsh village in North Wales called Llangollen. 
between 1780 and 1829. In fact, the ladies are the whole reason we have the wonderful historical term that is romantic friendships that really do trip historians up half the time. The term was coined in the 1970s by historian Elizabeth Maver when she wrote a book dedicated to the ladies, um, but she didn't want them to be associated with lesbianism and the queer community. So she created a term, romantic friendships, that made it sound like they were just friends who just so happened to have romantic feelings for one another, who just so happened to live, to love each other and want to live together. Um, and even though they lived a lot like Anne and Anne, like wives a little bit. And the two women, however, soon became major social figures within village life. They became tourist attractions due to the fact that Llangollen was often the first stop in me on many Welsh tours in the early 19th, 19th century. And you might notice the dates line up a bit with Anne Lister's life and that's, and Anne Lister actually visited the two ladies. And it was actually Mariana Lawton that visited them first and told Anne that she should visit them and also read about them on a newspaper article. So um, Anne and Aunt Anne went on a trip to Wales and went to visit the ladies. And while Eleanor was quite ill, when, while she was there, um, um, Sarah Bonsonby gave her a tour of the, la the grounds and even gave her a rose as a parting gift. To say thank you for visiting. And Plas Newid, like Shibden, embrace their queerness. They've never tried to hide it. They've never tried to hide the fact that the ladies, the most famous of their inhabitants, were queer. And they loved the fact that they had guests such as William Wordsworth and Lister, so Walter Scott and the Duke of Wellington coming to visit them to see how two ladies live together. And they even ran tours around the ground with guides dressed up like the ladies. They openly celebrate their queerness and it's amazing to see. And like other Welsh museums, we have started to show our queerness, like the one I work in. We have, in one museum exhibit, we have a teapot that features the ladies from 1900 and a toy bath, a little toy that has figures, the two pictures of the ladies from 1915. They continued to be tourist attractions long after they passed away because people loved them so much. And I mentioned labels earlier when it comes to teaching Anne's history and the fact that it can be quite limiting in what you can say. And that's exactly the same thing you can see with labels around museums, even in my workplace. Labels are only around the best labels 100 to 150 words, but often they have to be as low as 20 to 30 words and quite short because people just don't focus long enough. And there is a current debate with heritage studies as how we can get people to focus longer and learn more about the spaces they're in. I've seen firsthand people walk into the museum, look at the pretty things that we've got on display, the jewelry, the clothes, the old pieces of furniture. They don't read the labels and they walk out not learning something. But you only have a handful of people that read the labels and actively encourage and engage with us museum exhibits, um, museum assistants and the museum exhibits to actually talk about what they're learning. And while Plas Newydd is a popular heritage site, it's not as popular as Shibden and Sissinghurst and the others. And this may be down to the fact that unlike the last two sites, they don't have a TV show talking about the ladies. They, there's no film, there's no documentary, there's no TV show that shows the ladies' lives. Unlike Gentleman Jack and Vita in Virginia, we've seen, and we've seen when you've got something like Gentleman Jack, a good TV show, so well written and so historically accurate, it can project someone or a couple to a whole new level of popularity. And you can give them a fandom around the world that visit and give money and can help with the upkeep of buildings and can help with the upkeep of research time that you've got going on. And it can get people into mainstream queer history, like we've seen with Anne and Anne. TV and film really do affect what we see in heritage sites, but we've just never noticed. But there are all, there is issues when it comes to displaying queer history in museums. And while I do, well, while I did say we're seeing a huge mass, uh, mass acceptance of queer people in wider society, we're also seeing people who oppose it and believe people who and believe there is no space for LGBT history in heritage spaces. 
And again, I've witnessed this first firsthand with my workplace having recently installed a exhibit based on LGBT process, um, protest about section 28. Therefore, the growth in heritage spaces displaying heritage, um, LGBT history is slow, but it's growing. And more spaces that will and are displaying LGBT history can help with the growth. There are more heritage sites showing LGBT history more than ever. And while it's a slow growth, it's definitely growing. And it's giving people a place to explore and learn about their history. And that's so important to the community. Having a place that teaches queer history gives people a safe space to explore their history, their identity, and it gives them ancestors. We don't have blood ancestors in this community. Therefore, many people within the community often look to figures like Anne, Vita, the ladies of Llangollen, Lord Byron. Um, you know, we feel a connection to the past. We feel our ancestors. It gives many people, young people, a connection to engage with their history that currently is lacking in the current education system. And while being LGBT has been considered widely accepted in the past 20 years, society often treats us with a sense of otherness, um, you know, with the way they treat our history and our way of life, like our community, our culture and things like that. And so having the rise in mainstream media and heritage spaces normalizing queer heritage can only create positive change. Within the, in, within the community, within wider society, and the education of queer people and our, and our history. And we have places like Sissinghurst, Plasnewydd, Shibden and Newstead and others to thank for creating a safe space for heritage spaces, for people to explore their, their history and their queer ancestors. But we also have the media to thank for it too. Things like Gentleman Jack, Vita and Virginia, Dickinson, which focuses on the life of Emily Dickinson, Call the Midwife, and more recently, an Amazon Prime show called The League of Their Own, shows and films like this allow us to see ourselves in a historical context. We mostly see, you know, queer couples in the present, like in Orphan Black, Heartstopper, Sex Education, The L Word, Killing Eve, and etc. So shows and films that show that lesbians existed before the 1990s are a, such a big deal. And having a positive representation within historical context, within the media, is also a big deal because until the 90s, we were persecuted. Basically, we were treated with disdain. We were treated like we should be swept under the carpet. And, but there's so much room for import, in, in improvement. It's a slow process, but hopefully it's a process that will speed up from now as there's a demand for more queer history in heritage spaces and a demand for it to be shown more on our screens. So to conclude, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, the purpose of this study was just to analyze the effect of Anne Lister and on the LGBT, on, uh, Anne Lister had on LGBT heritage. LGBT history has often been overlooked and hidden from society. However, with a growing number of people wanting to learn about our history, and a growing number of people within the queer community calling for queer history to be shown in heritage spaces and on our screens. It's so important now to listen to the voices of those people because it's so important for queer people, especially young people, people who are growing up now to see themselves represented in museum spaces, in, on the TV, on TikTok, on everything. It's so important to how they view themselves. It helps us have a grounded space to explore our heritage. Shibden Hall is such an important space just to explore not only Anne's history, but our history as a community as a whole. Embracing our heritage helps the community grow and helps us as a movement to grow within our spaces. Anne's effect on LGBT history has been great. She's not only given people a historical figure that they can identify with, but has also given many in the community and researchers alike a clear and direct link to, to lesbian history. She proves that lesbians and other queer history people have always been in society. We're not a modern phenomenon. Anne links queer women to their history and has given many women and non-binary people a gateway to explore queer history. 
Shibden Hall has given many within the community a place to be able to visit and create a safe space to explore their history. She's also given historians, which is really important, a viable and solid source of primary evidence to discuss the queer experience within history. Her diaries have proved such have provided such a detailed record of the queer experience in the 19th century and provided such an important record of social, economic, political aspects of the early 19th century life that she's a well of information. And we, even, we haven't even tapped into half of what she's given us yet. Anne is our ancestor. And while we do not all, while we're not all blood related to her, she is a direct link to our history. She helps us trace back our history. She's in the long line of family tree where we can say that is a queer woman in history and that is who I want to research. That's who I want to learn about. That's giving me a space, a direct link to hundreds of years ago. And we've seen the effect in me the media too, how films and TV have affected what you see in heritage spaces and what you can see coming into mainstream history. Like with Vita in Virginia and Gentleman Jack, a leak of their own, and even with a film called Ammonite, based on the fossil hunters Mary Anning and Charlotte Mutchinson, there was a small boom in the, their popularity, with more people wanting to know more about their relationship. Obviously, only to find out that their relationship was only rumoured, but it still created a big boom in queer history. And queer media will always go hand in hand with queer history and what we see in heritage spaces and museums. And in the last 20 years, the call and need for heritage spaces to explore and teach queer history has only grown and, in, and is a process that Anne Lister and Gentleman Jack has helped speed up slightly. And museum museums are displaying exhibits with, with queer history, it's such an important space. We've seen so much, not only in my workspace, uh, my workplace called Amgia for Cymru, the National Trust, English Heritage, and they're beginning to show badges, books, diaries, all from queer people in history. And we've even seen dedicated queer museum museums opening up, like Queer Britain in London. And I'm going to leave you now with a quote from one of my participants, if you could, to the next slide, please. Um, we've all had to live secretly until fairly recently, so knowing there was people like us living in the 1800s, that we've always been here is really important. And that's from participant number 43. It's so important for us to see ourselves and to see ourselves represented, represented, represented. It can only make us more positive and a growing force and a growing space for our community. So Dior, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Um, those are two of my socials if you want to keep in touch and you want to see what I'm getting up to. Um, so, Diochen Vaud, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Uh, hang on. So there's one question. Uh, how can we make queer histories and stories accessible to people who may feel excluded, not ordinarily engaged in heritage spaces? It's a good question. Um, you know, there is a lot of people within the community, you know, there's um, not only just lesbians, there's gay men, there's trans women and men, there's non-binary people. So how do you gain that how do you make that history accessible to them and you just talk to them often you talk to these people and they will tell you how they want their history to be shown to you and you know some of them don't all you know, like like the question says not all who, people who don't ordinarily engage with heritage spaces you know you see you can create tv shows documentaries documentaries are such an important well of information you can see them wherever you go, even a short 10 minute YouTube documentary is so important to what you can learn. And you can learn it in 10 minutes. You can learn it wherever you are and it's so important. And you just have to talk to people. If you talk to more people, they'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you how 
how they want to learn. Some people don't learn by going to a museum and reading off things. They learn by seeing um, documentaries. They learn by listening to podcasts. They learn to by just reading a book. But they just don't learn by seeing things in a museum. It's quite important. And it's currently a debate on how you can teach people about in heritage studies, how you can teach people in a more accessible way. Um, yes. <laughs> Another question, if I had the budget and was set loose, let loose to create Shibden, what would I do? Um, Shibden do a really good job already. They do an amazing job at creating, curating what they can. If I had the money, I would obviously put it towards upkeeping the hall and sort of making enough time for research space. If I had the money, I'd be over there researching, helping them research for them. I understand they don't have a single curator for Shibden. They have curators all over um, for the Caladell Museum, um, for all the Caladell Museums. So there's no one set curator. So they have a lot on their plate. So if I had the money, maybe I'd just put one curator for each of the museums so you can focus on that learning. You can focus on that teaching and that research time. And you can create more, you can have more time to teach people and to transcribe her diaries. Like I said, we're not even halfway through what she's given us. So having all that time on your hands to be able to learn and to transcribe the diaries is such a wonderful space and a wonderful thing to have. Um, I'd love the money to go up there and just do it myself um, to be able to transcribe as many diaries as I can. But um, living in Wales really puts a stop to that. Um, is there a database for LGBT history online? I don't know. I don't think so. I had to learn a lot of it by um, going on to survey responses. There is reports that are often published by the National Trust on what they do um, via the Heritage Network. Um, and, you know, there are often reports published every year on how much queer media and queer representation we've seen with GLAD. Um, I think there should be a space dedicated to LGBT history online completely. You know, you just, you do have the books, you do have um, the museums, but you know, people just sometimes wanna just learn online and you need that in life, you need that space. So I'd happily, you know, I'd love to see one curated completely online. I'm going to ask a, a verbal question versus typing it in. So the thing that I'm kind of curious about, and like if, I know that you said that if you had a bunch of money, you would have individual curators, which is brilliant. But um, if I had a ton of money, actually, I would try to kind of cross pollinate with um, other kind of fan groups. I hate to use that term because it sounds so like whatever. But, um, you know, I'm trying to think of like um, in the U.S., you know, Willa Cather is a is a major author um, and celebrated in certain circles. And so I was kind of what what I was kind of wondering, like, is there a way you kind of cross pollinate with her fans? And I don't know, like, I think like Mae Sarton, too, was a, a um, another author. So just to like at least try to get it from, out from a academic literary standpoint. And I don't know, maybe there's going to be some trickle down <laughs> economics where, you know, it's going to. Um, where it's going to hit other people and 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 spread the good word of, of Ann Lister. Um, so that's always been kind of my fantasy. I don't know if you know if if you have thought about those things as well. Yeah, um, during my dissertation, um, I did a lot of research on how you can how you do sort of how other museums can help each other, and you can uh, you know you can have the databases, the cross databases. It's quite interesting. Sadly, I didn't do too much on it. I only touched on it, like I think it was only about two paragraphs that I talked about it, um, among other things. So I'm really, really interested in how you can sort of learn from other museums and you can cross sort of the different curators, you can learn from each other. So it's very interesting. It's very, it's growing. It's so like in my workplace, we have um, curators for everything, anything you can yeah. think of. And our LGBT history curator is, at, is at also the transport curator. So it does a lot of history on transport, but also tries to focus his time on queer history 
you know, and we've got curators in a different, we, we're a system of museums, a bit like Halladale. We've got museums everywhere. And so we do see our curators working together sometimes, but it is difficult. You know, people are available at different times and people are focusing on different things. It's a very interesting um, thing to look at and I'd love to do it more. Yeah, like I'd, I'd like to go see Willis' grave and a bunch of other authors' graves. And I do apologize for not raising my hand for asking a verbal question. Sorry for breaking the rules. It's all good. Um, how long have we got left? Have I got enough time for some more questions? Feel free to take more questions or you can finish up if you want to. So it's up to you. Um, can't find any more. Oh, here, um, it's very getting a bit difficult to find some questions. So I think I'll finish up there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, hope you enjoyed it and learned something, I guess. Thank you very much.